I thank you for the, the, the opportunity we have to learn more about you. Uh, Lord, you teach us uh, through so many situations and circumstances that we can trust you. You teach us, uh, Lord, how we should live, and we see it in your word over and over again. And Lord, I pray for us that as we take a look at this book and look at this chapter today, uh, Lord, I pray that you would remind us of something we've known before, that you would teach us something new, uh, but Lord, more than anything, that you would help us to trust you. Uh, Lord, that we would learn to live by faith in what in our day are also troubling times. Uh, and so we ask for your help in that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so in Habakkuk chapter 2, we're going to look at the first five verses uh, as a first section. Um, and we, had, we ended chapter 1 with Habakkuk crying out to God. And so uh, we find ourselves here in verse 1. Uh, where Habakkuk is waiting for God to answer. He says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol, like death he never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. So here, uh, one of the things that I, I think makes uh, this different is um, Habakkuk doesn't tell us the vision. You know, in many of the relationships between the Lord and the prophets, when they pray, God gives them a vision. We then get details of the vision. And instead, we get the response to the vision. Uh, and so there's a vision that God shows Habakkuk, and he doesn't outline that for us. Uh, what we see there is he says, uh, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. But we don't get the, the, it's not done in the same way. We get these woes to the Chaldeans that we'll see here in just a minute. And we get some things that we can really grab hold of tightly that teach us about the Lord. Uh, but one of the things that we begin to see, if you look there in verse 4, it says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. That we see that there are, there are two ways to live. Um, and in, in looking uh, in, in the two ways to live, we, we've got the first way uh, that we would say there is a way of pride. So in this first few verses, we have this, this exchange. Lord, I'm waiting for you to answer. The Lord answers, and he says, listen, the puffed up is one way, and the way of the righteous, they're going to live by faith. And so the, the answer that God gives him is that you must live by faith. He says, you got to live by faith. There's two options here. Don't take the way of the Babylonians or the Chaldeans, but instead follow faithfully. But there is a way of pride. Uh, there, there is a way of pride that we see in the Babylonians. And one of the things that I found myself thinking about was what we talk about pride all the time in the church, but we don't always do an examination of pride in, in the life of the church. And, and, and pride is so prevalent. It, it works its way into our lives so easily. Uh, that we, we need to make sure that we have a, a good grasp of, of pride. And so there's two ways to live. There's pride and the way of pride. Uh, so prideful living looks this way. Prideful living is selfish. Um, prideful living would be thinking about self. Uh, prideful living would be loving yourself above God and others or valuing yourself above others or just being preoccupied with others. Uh, so prideful living is selfish. Uh, you're thinking about yourself all the time. You're loving yourself more than the Lord and anyone else. You're valuing yourself above others, or you're even just simply preoccupied with yourself. Um, and I know that for me, I read that little list real quickly. And I'm like, nope, I don't think I have a problem with pride. Uh, and so I think it's worth going a step further and asking the question like, well, how does pride show up? Or what are some evidences of pride that we would see in our lives? And so I want to point out, I know it's a lot, it's 11, but we're going to do them anyway. So one would be unteachable. That one of the evidences uh, that pride exists in someone's life is that you aren't teachable. 
believing you already know what someone is going to say uh, or being unable to receive even constructive criticism uh, would be an evidence of pride. Uh, Another one would be being obsessed with physical appearance. Obsessed with physical appearance. Now, I'm not talking about being healthy. So I, I heard one time a conversation uh, and, and realized uh, we as a culture, what I mean by culture is just like the, the West America. We, we are very obsessed with our appearance. Um, and I remember hearing someone say, you know what people in third world countries don't worry about when it comes to heaven or eternal life? And I heard someone say, well, what do you think? And they go, they don't care how they're going to look. Like, have you ever, ever I, like, so just think, how many times in your life have you asked the question or been in a church Bible study where somebody said, hey, hey, what are we going to look like? Am I going to be the 18-year-old version of myself? Am I going to be the 65-year-old version of myself? And in, in eternity, you know, and so I, I remember looking at some, some ladies one time and going, you don't need to worry about whether or not you can wear yoga pants in eternity. Like, that's not what this needs to be. Men don't need to be worried if we can go around with our shirts off in eternity. And that, that's one of those things where when you think about the culture that we live in, it's breeding pride because our culture is obsessed with what we look like. Uh, one of the things that Jill and I talk about uh, with, with couples all the time is that the way that God made us is that we are to look our age. Like, so God designed us to look our age. He made us to age. We have to trust him that there is even design in that, that it's okay that someone looks like they've had children. Like, like it, it's okay that you look your age. Um, if God wanted your body to do different, then it would. Uh, and, and so and we, we need to make sure that we're not, again, healthy, obsessed with physical appearance. They're, they're not the same thing. Uh, if, if, if your vanity has reached the point um, where you've decided which version of yourself you ought to be in eternity, one, no, you're not alone. It's one thing to want. It's another thing to obsess. And so, uh, but a third thing would be uh, too good to do some things. Like, I don't... I, I don't do the dishes. That's for other people. Or I don't, I don't vacuum. I don't clean toilets. I don't, you know, people say things like that. Like, I don't, I don't do that. Well, you can't be too good to do stuff. They can't. It's just there's, there doesn't need to be anything that's below us. Um, there just doesn't need to be anything in life that we're not willing to do. Um, one of my most, I think, eye-opening experiences um, was I, I had an opportunity when I was in, uh, when we lived down near New Orleans and I was serving at a church in Hammond, uh, and there was a gentleman in our church um, by the name of Preston Allison who was just a godly saint. He had helped with the founding of the church uh, decades before and had written so much of the documentation for the church. And his brother was a gentleman named Gray Allison, uh, and Gray Allison founded Mid America Seminary right there in Memphis. Uh, and so it was, it was Gray's brother that was a member of our church. Um, and we, we just began developing a relationship. Like I was just intrigued. You know, here was this, this older saint uh, who just dripped of scripture and had this just neat way about him. Uh, and then one day, um, the Corcorns, they would go and they would take care of them and they would help Mr. Allison with a few things and often take his wife to the doctor when she had diabetes appointments and one day, the Corcoran's were like, listen, we, we need someone else to come and, and sit with Mr. Preston. And I was like, well, I'll go sit. And so I go sit with Mr. Preston. And a great time. We watched all these old VHS tapes of sermons from all these great men he had met along the way. And, you know, we talked about stuff. And then, you know, a couple of weeks go by and I started doing this. It becomes my regular routine that every time the Corcoran's would take his wife, I would go sit with Dr. Allison. And so it just became this really fun thing. And, uh, and one day we're sitting there and he looks at me and he goes, man. I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to need your help. And I was like, oh, okay, Dr. R, what do you need? You need something to drink? Or he goes, no, I normally go to the bathroom before you get here. But man, it just, it just didn't happen before you got here today. And uh, I was like, oh, okay, well, I mean, I, I can open the door. And he goes, no, I don't think you understand. I need help at every level in the process. I was like, oh. He goes, 
yeah. I was like, well, okay then. You know, and like, and, and right there you have that moment. Am I going to be prideful and say, I can't do that? Or am I going to help this man that's just another brother in Christ who's in need? And so I got home and I looked at Jill and I was like, she was a nurse. And I was like, listen, I, I just want you to know y'all may be the most humble people in the world as nurses. Because you do things that so many people in this world would never want to do. And, uh, and after that, Dr. Allison and I, we were really, really close. We became, we had all kinds of inside jokes that began to happen after that. And so, but, you know, there really can't ever be anything in our lives that we are too good to do. Uh, because my experiences are we're going to eventually all be in a position where we're going to need somebody else to lay their pride to the side and, and help us as well. And so, um, but an evidence of pride would be someone who says, I'm just too good to do. It's one thing to say, I don't like it or I don't want it. It's another thing to say, I won't do it. And so we never need to have a position in our hearts where we're not willing to do what needs to be done. Another one is the need to teach everyone else. This one, um, I think social media has just fueled this. Um, and, I, and I would even make clarification, this is, like, I would not say that your math teacher who's teaching you math has this problem. Uh, you know, like, there are people that have been given positions or responsibilities in which they are supposed to teach. They are, are supposed to correct. You know, you, if you've got uh, a person who's training you to do a job or a person who oversees you and manages you uh, in your workplace, it's right for them to stop you and to say, hey, that's not how we're supposed to do that. This is the right way to do it. So, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the need to teach other people every single thing, to correct every single thing. <laughs> And I feel like social media has just revealed the hard hearts of so many, the, the prideful hearts of so many in, in their, uh, their need to correct everyone and, and teach everyone. Another characteristic is unwilling to ask for help. Kind of an American dilemma, right? You know, by, by, by our nature as Americans, we don't need help. We don't want help. And so, um, but it, being unwilling to ask for help is an evidence of pride. Uh, it's one thing to say, I wish I didn't have to ask for help. It's another thing to say, I, I want to be able to do this on my own. But it's a whole other thing to realize that you don't know how to do it or you can't do it on your own and then to still be unwilling to ask for help. Um, now, if you ask for help and no one shows up and you then still go do it and break your hand, uh, like I can think of so many times in my life where whether it's through church or family, someone has shown up and I'm like, well, what happened? Well, I knew I needed help, but I did it by myself anyway. And there's a broken foot or a broken wrist or a broken finger, you know, and, and so, but it often it's not just in the physical realm. It's this idea that maybe you need someone to talk to or you need someone to pray for you. Or, um, but, but one of the evidences of pride would be an unwillingness to ask for help. Uh, another one would be to talk about yourself. And I'm going to put um, often slash all the time and then this is not you sitting with your friends, having a meal, and telling stories of what all you've done in your life. Like, we gotta, we gotta make a distinction. We're not talking, like, like, it's perfectly good to sit around and go, man, let me tell you about this one time. Like, that's a good thing. But what we need to avoid is this idea that we are constantly talking about ourselves, never asking anyone questions about them, never remembering anything about anybody else. It's just always about us. Uh, and so people who talk about themselves all the time, and, and one of the reasons that that's an evidence of pride is because many people who do that simply just, they're, they're revealing their desire to feel important and for everybody to know about them, the things that they have done. And so, uh, but again, I would draw a line, like, um, like if Richard and I want to go sit and talk about all the places we've been and things we've done and laugh and, oh, that reminds me of this time and that reminds, that is not what we're talking about. We're, we're not talking about the enjoyable relational sharing. We're talking about the person that in that kind of puffed up way uh, is making sure everybody knows about them. 
Uh, and and I, I think you, you've lived enough to know the difference between that. Now, disregarding the wisdom of others. So if you disregard the wisdom of others, it's one thing to disagree. I think in, in today's world, um, I find myself trying to help people to think often about the um, it's one thing to offer varying opinions and perspectives and realize someone disagrees with you, but when you see someone who's just consistently ignoring wisdom, just determined that their way is the right way and never walking something back or never taking the advice of someone else, that would be an evidence of pride. Uh, another one would be regularly critical. So if you're regularly critical, I'm not saying that there's never a place for criticism, but regularly critical, the, the individual that's all the time critical, and every time they talk, it's, it's critical of this and critical of that, and this person did this, and this person did that, and always kind of pointing out the things. That would be an evidence of pride. Uh, the need for constant affirmation. The need for constant affirmation. Now, I would say, having spent most of my life in ministry working with millennials, I, I don't want to take digs at them. I actually I try to guard them and protect them often because I've seen some of the good sides of millennials. I know most of the world doesn't point out their good sides, um, but you know, I was a youth pastor. That's who I youth pastored is millennials and i think highly of them in a lot of ways but i would say one thing that i've noticed in them is the need for constant affirmation and i don't know i don't know yet that i would say that it is consistently pride on behalf of millennials because i think in many ways they've just been empty their parents have been off chasing their own dreams and that the generation of parents that have raised millennials in large part have been a both parents working in almost all the homes and chasing after their dreams and chasing after their wants. And, and, and in many ways, a lot of millennials are just not parented. They've just not been parented well. And so uh, even when you read, because uh, I've had to, because we, we hire some here, and then like you just want to do well, you want to help, you know, so you read about the older generations, you read about the younger generations, and one of the trends uh, that you see in, in working with millennials, even when you hire them, is the recognition that your first 18 to 24 months may feel like parenting more than it feels like being the boss. Uh, that, that in many ways, there's just a lot of things that they need, and one of them is affirmation. Uh, and so I have found myself beginning to try to make a, a to, to get to know people well enough to know, is the person around me who's always needing affirmation, uh, is it a woman whose husband isn't loving her well? Is it a man who feels uh, unfulfilled and has never been, been really affirmed by his father? Or, and so I have to be really careful with the constant affirmation, with immediately jumping to pride with, with affirmation, because sometimes it's somebody who really just is empty. But there are other people that just want constantly for them to be the person affirmed in the situations. They need it constantly. They can't ever sit in a situation. They've always got to, to kind of one up for the sake of affirmation. Again, different than sitting with your friends and well, one time I did this, but that in the crowded room, needing everybody to, to affirm them and, and not able to really deal with their, with their faults. Another one would be unwilling to submit to authority. So, characteristic of pride just doesn't submit doesn't recognize um that that the authority whether it's a boss or a parent or you know um elected officials or e even in the church different different ways that authority would happen um and then one uh that i i find to be pretty consistent name dropping all the time and i put the all the time because we all name drop sometimes right like it, every every one of us is like oh I, i've got a famous friend <laughs> or i've got a friend who's been so it, it's one thing to do it some 
one of the things that I would say that I would, I would just kind of put in that category of pride is there is a frequency that I think should determine whether or not we, we would see someone as pride. If not, then we're going to label some people prideful because they had a bad moment. They may have been prideful in that moment, but we don't need to label people as a prideful person based on one situation that we have witnessed. It needs to be based on some consistency, some habitual patterns. Um, but when we think about the pride uh, that we keep seeing in Scripture, these are some evidences of pride. Um, I wanted to give a quick caveat. Um, met with another pastor yesterday um, in our community, and he and I were, were just visiting at, at his request, wanted to talk through some things um, that are happening. And in, and in the conversation, we both just talked about how in today's world, um, there really seems to be a, a, a new way of interacting with leaders, uh, whether that is pastors, whether that is politicians, uh, whether that's organizational leaders and some or other organization that you're a part of, whether it's school superintendents, like our culture has shifted in the way that we deal with people in, in leadership positions. And so um, I found myself writing some of this down uh, after our conversation yesterday uh, that we, we find many pastors and leaders just very quickly labeled as prideful. Um, that, that we, we see one thing or we hear one thing. One of the things that, that he and I talked about, um, that in, in, say, for instance, in a church, um, you have hundreds, if not thousands of people all watching one person. Uh, and it's just called the glass house effect. Um, and, and you see it in, in so many organizational situations. So we're the church, so I'll, I'll talk about it related to the church. When you have one person being watched by hundreds, if not thousands of people, uh, and every one of them uh, may see the same moment. And then the next thing you know, you get hundreds of people offering you sometimes the same constructive criticism. And he and I were talking about how that literally can drown a pastor. Uh, and we were talking about this because two more pastors that we know in the last two weeks have resigned from ministry and said, I'm done with it. And this is why the overwhelming constant level of criticism, uh, the constant labels, the constant, and because it's just what our culture does. It's what the news does. They don't tell us news anymore. They talk about people. Uh, it, it's, it's what we hear on the radio. It's what we read on the internet. It's what we see on social media. And it has completely infiltrated the, the bodies of Christ all over our country. And so uh, public leadership positions are more like glass houses than they have ever been. And we have to also know it. Like, I, I, that's what he and I talked about. Like, if you're going to say yes to serving in any type of public leadership position, you now have to do, you have to go in knowing this is the new normal, um, that we don't know that this will change. Matter of fact, it may be better now than it's going to be in five years. And so you just have to go in knowing uh, that you're just going to be more criticized. You're going to be more publicly ostracized than any generation of leader or, or pastor in the history of our country. Uh, and, and he and I were talking about how that kind of stinks to be, you know, still 20 to 25 years of it left <laughs> and making that kind of realization. Um, but we, we've just talked with so many. Uh, and, and so here's, here's one of the things that I wanted to say when it comes to pointing out possibly something like pride or just in general, uh, just kind of a practical lesson. I, I've said this before. Um, I think you need to ask yourself when you see something in someone else's life, you need to ask yourself one Make sure I get them in the right order. Does it need to be said? You see something, uh, you hear a word, you see an action, you see a facial expression. You, you have to ask yourself, do, does what I want to go tell them, does it need to be said? Secondly, you have to ask, does it need to be said, does it need to be said right now? Ask yourself three questions. So if you see something, and just for example, if you see, you notice that, you're, that a person in the crowd is obsessed with their physical appearance. 
It's very clear there's a pride issue here. You gotta ask yourself, okay, well, well, does it need to be said? Ask yourself then the second question, does it need to be said right now? Do, do, do I need to do it right now? Because I would tell you what I see in culture and even personally is people don't wait anymore. <laughs> we don't wait anymore, you know? We don't wait, we're just right there in front of everybody and then you're sitting there going, hmm. If you think I'm as sinful as you think I am, doing this in public is probably not a good idea. Because what if I respond as the sinner that you think I am right now publicly? That's what I try to tell people. So if you think someone is prideful and maybe like this, maybe, maybe don't do it publicly. And so, um, but does it need to be said? Does it need to be said right now? And then the most important question, am I the one to say it? These three questions have been around for a long time. Somewhere we missed a generation or two, or we just decided we don't care anymore. Does it need to be said? Does it need to be said right now? And am I the one to say it? This is the, this is the one that I wish everybody would ask. Because I, the, the, I'm convinced that refusing to ask number three is an evidence of pride. If you can't ask number three, then you are prideful too. Because the assumption that because you saw it and you think it needs to be said, that you are the one who has to say it is rooted in the same places that pride is coming from. And here's why I would say that, because if you're at work and everybody sees it, well, did the boss see it? If the boss saw it, let the boss handle it. If you're at church and the youth minister sees it, maybe let the youth minister handle it if it was with one of the teenagers. If he doesn't handle it right then, he may have said, this isn't the right time to embarrass the 14-year-old in front of the other 80 to 100 teenagers. Maybe there's some grace in the process. Or just because the pastor's in the room and somebody says something doesn't mean that he won't talk to them later. Maybe he doesn't want to do that in front of everyone else because, again, it just may not be the the right time. And so uh, in most churches, in, in just speaking even in terms of the church like ours, there are a lot of layers of accountability in a congregation like ours. You know, you've got multiple committees. You've got multiple bodies like deacons and personnel committees. There's other staff members. There's, uh, there's all kinds of layers in a church like ours where there is accountability for the different types of leadership positions that we have. Uh, and so we have to ask ourselves, is, is this right? It's, it's likely that if you see it, so does someone else. Uh, and in fact, I find many pastors often see their own faults. And so here's why I think number three becomes really important. In scripture, we're told to imitate our pastors. Well, I would just say to give you an example using me, I am prone to let the word and the Holy Spirit do the work, personally. Like, I I don't think I need to take, I don't think I need to take it into my hands until I know clearly that the Lord has put that in my hands. So when you see someone and they say something or they do something uh, in the same way that Pastors don't wander around the church building confronting everybody every week with all the things that they have heard or seen that are happening in their personal lives. I think it would be good, uh, as as my buddy and I talked yesterday, we, we all think at this point that it would be good if the congregation could learn that same discipline that we, we as pastors, y'all know everything about us and we know a lot about you. And we don't walk up and down the halls and point out what we know. We don't point out what we saw on social media. We don't point out what we heard you said at Walmart or what you did in the restaurant. And, and I really think, and it's because we find ourselves, at least I do, asking the question, one, does it need to be said right now? Well, no, it doesn't need to be said right now in the hallways of the congregation. If it's something that, that really deserves confrontation, there needs to be a level of respect in that moment. And And then you have to ask yourself, am I the one to say it? Because often they're married to someone who I'm pretty convinced when they get home will take care of it. Or they have parents that I'm pretty convinced also saw it. And when they get home, they'll say, or they've got friends, or they've got people in their Sunday school class. And I think we have to find ourselves more and more when we see something that we believe should be pointed out and dealt with, ask ourselves the triage questions. And if you're not the one to say it, then you just pray, trust, 
that the Lord is also working and that the Lord saw it and that, that he's going to work, you know? So one of the things, I had a friend in ministry when we lived in Tennessee, an older gentleman uh, nearing retirement now, and he used to joke, we, we'd all be at lunch somewhere, and, and he would just say, man, God gifted me with the gift of offending people. <laughs> and I used to sit there and go, man, that is really funny, but that's terrible. You know, like that doesn't need to be like, yeah, I've got, and, and, and I found myself going, I think there's a lot of people who feel like they've been given the gift of criticism, you know? And so we have this, we have this way in our culture now where we believe God's called every one of us to be the moral policeman for every single person. And we've lost sense of the layers and maybe even the public decorum that should exist in our lives. God doesn't call people to a ministry of criticism. Uh, that is an evidence of pride. Not only is the inability to receive constructive criticism, but that idea of criticizing other people. And so uh, 2 Timothy 3 says that the word of God does the work of rebuking and correcting. And if we'll trust the Lord uh, and let the Holy Spirit work, I think often you will see the correction happen and you don't have to be the person who takes it. <clears throat> right, let me give you a few woes. I'm gonna try to get us out of here and. <laughs> 15 minutes or less. Um, I did not expect that to take so long. All right, so there's some woes that begin to happen. Uh, so um, two ways to live, the way of pride. And so I gave you lots of talk about the characteristics of pride. And then you get the woes beginning in verse 6. Uh, Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? He loads himself with pledges. And so as, as he begins to deliver these woes or judgments uh, on the Chaldeans. Um, and I'm going to say those who, woe to those who steal and lust for power. So this way of pride bears itself out in, in, in a, a willing to take something that you've not earned, taking something uh, that doesn't belong to you, that, that lust for power. Um, in verses 9 through 11, we get a woe to the greedy and dishonest. So we, he, he's beginning to, we, we've described the Chaldeans or the Babylonians in chapter one, pretty much this way. Uh, God, why would you let these kinds of people? And so then God replies, and this is how God replies. You know, the, the righteous are going to live by faith and then woe to those who live this, this prideful, boastful, boastful, puffed up, way of living. So in verses 9 through 11, you have woe to him who gets evil gain for his house to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. Uh, you've devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You forfeited your life for the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the woodwork respond. Uh, and not only does, does he say woe to those who do that, but there in verse, verse 11, uh, we have that they're, they're, it's not going to go unpunished. Uh, that one of the things that God is doing in the woes is reminding both the Babylonians and Judah, there is no place you can go high enough. Like an eagle's nest is high, but it's not higher than the Lord can go. That's kind of the imagery uh, that he's giving. And so woe to the greedy, uh, and then woe to the violent. In that next set of verses, beginning in verse 12, um, woe to the violent, woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire, labor merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So again, it's not always going to be this way. Yes, the, the, the Chaldeans have built their empire on the blood of their enemies. They've literally built their cities by the, at the ruin of other peoples, um, but it's not going to always be that way. There's a day coming when the world will only be filled with the glory of the Lord. And so, uh, so woe to the violent, um, woe to drunkenness, lust, and um, how can I make that word fit here? Let's just say, and corrupting. So if you're taking notes, woe to drunkenness, lust, and corrupting. We have a desire for power here and here we just have in general just this fleshly desire to so just appease the flesh. He says, woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you. 
The utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beast that terrified them. And so the, 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 the picture, the woe, woe to you. You've not only been a drunken people, you've led other people to be drunken. You've done it even to their shame. Uh, and so woe to them. And then in, in the fifth one is woe to those who practice idolatry. Woe to those who practice idolatry. There in verse 18, he says, What prophet is an idol for its maker trust in his own creation when he makes speechless idols? So woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple, and let all the earth keep silent before him. And so uh, we have these five woes. These are... This way of living, this way of pride, we kind of look through some very practical ways to maybe expose pride in our own lives, but these woes are all built on pride. Like this is the way of the Babylonians. Um, I want to give you a few modern idols, and um, what I'm going to do is we'll list these, and then in a moment I'll say, listen, if you planned to leave by now, you can leave without feeling any guilt, and those of us who want to stay and talk through it for a few extra minutes can do that. Um, but some modern idols would be self and identity. And the reason I point out these, it's pretty easy, I think, in most of our lives to say, am I stealing, lusting for power? Am I greedy? Am I dishonest? Am I violent? Am I a drunkard? Am I lustful? Am I corrupting other people? That I think very, most of us in the room could very quickly say yes or no to that list. But idolatry is like pride. It's one of those that sneaks in. And it's one of those things that, like pride, we may cut it off at the ground, but we don't always go for the root. And so I think it's worth looking at some modern versions. So yourself or your identity, I would say that, that there is an idol today in our culture of what people think about me. Like we are willing to build our lives and make our decisions based on how it makes other people think or what it makes them think about us. Uh, another one would be money, or another way to put it would be consumerism, because it may not be money for you, it may be stuff. Money may be the means to stuff, like I just need stuff, I need more. Uh, and so there's the idolatry of consumerism, where we're filling our lives um, even trips can become consumeristic. Like it's one thing to go, our family needs a break, we're gonna go spend time together, build some meaningful relationships, do some neat things as a family. It's another thing when the trip is the goal. The trip should be the means to the goal uh, for your family. Money should be the means to something else, but often when money or the stuff uh, or the event becomes the end rather than the means, we, we find ourselves having, having idols. Uh, a third one would be entertainment. Entertainment is increasingly an idol in our culture. Uh, and what I mean by that, it's not just that you can't be entertained. It becomes an idol when you're literally, things in your emotional condition, if the Bible would have you pray and read scripture, but instead you spend hours watching, hours being entertained, hours going away from the Lord to entertainment. Um, that's how I would say we're, we're dealing with idolatry. And more and more often to deal with our stress, to deal with our issues, to deal with our struggles, to deal with our burdens, we're turning to entertainment. Entertain me, distract me from, from my reality. And so uh, a fourth one is probably one most people would put as number one, but just in our culture, uh, the idolatry of sex. Like it, it's just, it is an idol and it's always been an idol. Um, you'll notice in, in, in one way or another, all of these modern idols are present in every generation and in every society that has ever existed in the world, except for number six, the way it exists today. We'll get there. But this is, this is to make sure we're dealing with sexual gratification. We're not talking about that we shouldn't have it as, as Christians. We're just saying it's not soul satisfying. Like, but our culture kind of puts sex at the pinnacle of our relationships with one another. Like the reason for the relationship is for sex rather than being sex inside the context of the very meaningful relationship God gives us with our spouse. Uh, and so the, the things become idolatry 
when they move from the means to they become the end. They, they become the goal for us. And so uh, another one would be comfort. We want comfort. We just want it. And we're willing to do whatever it takes to have it. Uh, and so an idol in today's culture is the desire for comfort. And am I saying it's wrong to be comfortable? No. Is it wrong to live uh, in, inside the means that you have? No. Is it wrong to have a, a nice car or a nice home? No. But when the goal of your life becomes comfort, that, that's when, when we move towards idolatry. And then the sixth one um, is, we've kind of hinted at it in different ways already today. So there's connection, but I'm going to put related to smartphones and social media that at this point in our culture, in, in our modern day culture, now smartphones can be the, the, the gateway to some of these other things, but in general, uh, connection is not a bad thing. Uh, smartphones are not a bad thing. Social media is not a bad thing. The problem is we're now seeking satisfaction through those, like through the idea of what we can get, this thing's been buzzing the whole time, what we can get <laughs> through this, there's, yes, there are 16 text messages waiting for me when we finish this, all from, from a, just a group of pastors who are probably talking about the NFL or something today. And so, um, but there's connection here, like there's connection in your pocket or in your purse all the time. And if we're not careful, this becomes an idol. This becomes my end. I feel self-satisfied here. Uh, it becomes addictive to us. Uh, smartphones have become idols rather than tools. Um, if uh, you don't just walk around holding a hammer and looking at a hammer all day long, it's a tool. You have a reason for the hammer, there's a purpose for the hammer, there's a goal for the hammer, and you use the hammer for its intended purposes. Now, this is an advanced hammer. That's how we should see this. Oh, got another text message right there. Um, this is an advanced hammer. We, we, we should see this as a tool that has a place, it has a purpose, it has a design, but most of our, our lives are just becoming overrun with literally the modern day equivalent of a hammer. Like it, it's just living, it's controlling us as a people. And so that's why I would put it in that modern idol category. Um, it is a gateway to sex, comfort, entertainment, consumerism, and even platforming your own identity. You care so much about what people think that you can't ever be honest on social media. You know, you've never burned anything in the kitchen, so you never do <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So like you don't put pictures of your burnt food or your messy house. And um, so it is a gateway to that, but in its own right at this point, it has become an idol of its own uh, where, where we are often living to use it rather than it being a useful part of, of our living. And so some modern idols. Uh, and then when you read through uh, Habakkuk, I want to point out a couple things, not just about all the negatives, but um, one of the things that he says that the righteous are going to live, there in verse 4, he says the righteous are going to live by faith. Now, you can go back and listen to last week's if you want online. Uh, we kind of unpacked Galatians 2.20, uh, where Paul says to live as Christ is to live by faith in the one who saved him and gave himself up for us. And so we have this picture of faith all throughout Scripture, but we're told that the righteous live by faith. But one thing I wanted to point out is that Christians don't live by blind faith. Just because Scripture says we can't see him, that doesn't mean that our faith is blind. And we have this idea often in kind of southern church world where it's blind faith. God, you got to trust him. you got to have blind faith. Listen, the entire history of this world is filled with acts of God that we can base our faith on. The cross is an act of God that we base our faith faith on it's not blind he's unseen and, and there's a difference there's a difference and, and being able to say I, it, it's not blind faith the whole bible and the world's history 
is filled with God's actions and his proving that he is who he says he is and that he is faithful. So even here, as God is talking to Habakkuk and answering Habakkuk's questions, he said, listen, you got to trust me on the timing. It wasn't that it was a blind faith. It's this idea that instead of blind faith, we have to just recognize there are times where we don't know exactly how or the, or the means by which God is going to accomplish it, but we have the history of God's working behind us that gives us confidence that we can trust him in this situation. Like Adam and Eve were not walking in the garden with blind faith. God came, spoke to Noah, spoke to Abraham, spoke to Moses. Like we have all the, we have angels showing up and telling people things on behalf of the Lord. There was, God has consistently given us an actionable faith. Like we, we, we know him. We've, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father, but blessed are those who will have faith in the future without seeing me because we have this like, all of this is stuff that we can see, that we can know. And so um, when we think about living by faith, I, I don't think we need to be intentionally ignorant of all that we can know. J- just this week, I was around some guys that were talking uh, at, a, at an event here in our city on Monday, and, and one of the things that, that one of the guys was saying, he, he, he was saying, like, listen, we're Christians, and we just can't know. We just can't know. And I am sitting in the back of the room going, man, there is so much that you can know. Like, like when, you, when you think about all that we do know and can know. And so we need to make sure that when we go to living by faith, that we anchor ourselves the way that God anchors Habakkuk. Listen, Habakkuk, you, you're not going to know maybe the timing isn't what you would want or the method may not be the means that you would want, but you can trust me. Like, you can trust me. You can, you can trust me that you can have faith in me. Uh, and so in verse 14, if you look there, he says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Like, we, we can trust that there is a day coming, both for Habakkuk and also for us, where there will be no more of this. The world will not be filled with all of the woes. The world will not be filled with all the evidences of pride. The world will not be filled with idols, but instead the world will only be filled with the knowledge and the glory of God, that that's what happens when Christ comes back. Uh, And so the basis for our faith and our trusting that God is going to redeem and to restore, you look right there in verse 20, but the Lord is in his holy temple. These idols are silent, They're wood, they're stone, they're gold, they're silver, they're silent, there's no one there. You can cry to them all you want to, you can dance all you want, you can cut yourself all you want. They're never going to respond. But Habakkuk is literally hearing from God because he's real and he's sitting in his holy temple even now. That it's not, a, it's not a, an, a, a blind and completely unknown faith. That Habakkuk, you can trust me. You can trust me. You can trust that it's going to be what I've said it's going to be. It's going to happen the way I've said it's going to happen. You can remember back what happened with Nahum and Josiah. You can trust me now. You can go all the way back to every other king, every other prophet, every other person I've made a covenant with, with my nation. And you can trust me, Habakkuk. I am still in my temple that that's the basis for our faith and our hope. R.C. Sproul said that we, we do this. He said, living by faith means that sometimes we hold on to a barren cliff with our fingernails with all our strength as we trust in an invisible God. That living by faith means we don't quit. Like we don't quit. And the motivation we have is Christ. God's demonstrated his faithfulness to us, the true, real act of Christ on the cross in history. Like it happened. We can trust him. And so in those moments where it feels troublesome, I love R.C.'s thing, you just hold on to a barren cliff with your fingernails, with all of your strength while you trust in an invisible God. Don't let go. Don't tap out. Don't bow out because it's hard. He is still on his throne, seated in his temple and and we can trust him even in our troubled times i'm going to pray for us 
And if your stomach is growling so much that you can't hang out for a minute, if you want, you can. We can ask questions and talk for a few more minutes, but I want to give those who may have another appointment a chance to slide out. But let's pray. Father, thank you for being there for us. While we can't see you, we do know you. While we can't uh, see you physically, Lord, like your, like your word says, we can see the evidence of the wind and we can see the evidence of you at work, the saved people who are in this room. Uh, Lord, the ways that you've worked in the establishment of your church throughout history, the saving of your people, the covenants that you have made, or the accounts of your wondrous and miraculous works that we have in Scripture. Lord, you've given us so much, so much that we can cling to. So I pray that you help us to cling with all of our might to you and that we would trust that while you are invisible, you are very there, very close, and always working. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.